Hello and welcome to Happy Horror Time. I'm Matt Emmert. And I'm Tim Murdoch. And if you're a fan of the Halloween series, and who isn't, then you definitely know today's guest. She played Final Girl Kara Strode, the adopted cousin of Laurie Strode, who fights Michael Myers in the 1995 sequel, Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. No stranger to the horror genre, she also starred in such films as Stakeland, Breadcrumbs, and Last Kind Words. Please welcome to the podcast, author and actor on stage, TV, and the big screen, Marianne Hagan! Woo! Hi. How are you? How are you? We are so excited to have you on. Yes. I'm so excited to be here. That is awesome. You know, before we even jump into anything Halloween or horror related, I read that you grew up in New York City and graduated with a BA in political science from Duke University. How did that lead to a career in acting? Okay. Well, first of all, I grew up in um, Westchester County. I, oh, okay. I was I, th I was born in the Bronx and like when I was six months old, my family moved to Westchester County. So that's where I grew up. But I grew up in a family that had absolutely zero connections to quote unquote show business. So the idea that someone might choose acting as a career was just the most insane concept ever so it wasn't even a thing like I wasn't a child actor I didn't like go to like you know musical theater camp and stuff like that I was just a student you know and uh but my dad did get us into the city to see all the big Broadway shows and that was always just very magical yeah and then while at Duke uh, just on a whim, I took an acting class and kind of fell in love. Oh, and then um, my junior year, there was a notice up for auditions for the, you know, the fall show. And it was Jean Ennui's Ring Around the Moon. So I was in the library and instead of doing my work, I went and I found a copy of the play and I read the play. And I was like, I could play Countess Diana. I could do that <laughs> yeah. with my eyes closed in my sleep. So <laughs> I went to the audition and I got it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Hey. And I wasn't a drama major. So it was a like, like kind of a scand. It was a little bit of a scandal because really technically only, only drama majors could be in the main stage plays. But the director who was from New York City and wasn't a professor at Duke said, I don't care, I want her. But oh. after being in that show, I was just completely bitten by the acting bug. And my senior year, I applied to all these journalism schools because that's that was the path I was supposed to be on. And I was gonna go to Columbia. And I said to my parents, I wanna be, I wanna pursue acting. I I this is what thrills me. This is what gives me a life force. And they Good said, for you. Yeah. They Good for said you. okay, well, I could defer Columbia. I could defer the acceptance for two years. And they said, okay, take two years. And if nothing is happening by the end of two years, you have to go to journalism school at Columbia. And I went to uh, Circle and Square Theater School in the city, in New York City. And like within a year, I had an agent. I got my SAG card because I got like two lines in a big movie. And I had, you know, I was auditioning all the time. So things were happening. And so at the end of two years, like, you know, things were kind of really going along so the idea of going you know stopping that and you know doing a, a complete pivot uh was you know insane yeah that is such a great story like yeah. that you kind of just um you found it you were into it and then it just happened for you you know that's really I got, awesome I got I got super lucky and I emphasize the word lucky like really quickly because I have friends who are just geniusly talented and they couldn't get an agent until they were like 32. Like they didn't get into SAG until they were 34, you know, and they're far more talented than I am. That it's just 
You know, mm-hmm. it's so much of it is being in the right place at the right time. Um, it's a balance of luck and you do have to have talent. Yeah. I mean, well, one of the things I really love is um, before we jump into all the horror questions, um, you were on an episode of Who's the Boss? It was your first acting job. I, I watched the episode. I totally remember your episode. And I just want to know, what was Tony Danza like? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm glad you asked me this because no one ever asks me and I want to tell people Tony Danza was the nicest man in the world. Wow. He was, yeah. oh my God, class, class, class. He, you know, here I was, it was my first um, job in LA and it was just a guest spot. And I was like 22, I was, you know, you know, so nervous and overwhelmed. And he comes right up. He, he shakes the hands of all the guest people says, welcome to the family. We're going to have fun this week. And he treated me and the other guest people as equals. And he, uh, on the night that we tape in front of the studio audience, a gorgeous bouquet of flowers in my dressing room from Tony Danza saying, thanks for doing the show. Wow. wow. I, I, I'm impressed. Nice. That, when you said he's the nicest, I was like, oh, he probably said hi to her, was nice. That is like over and above. That's really cool. He's class. He's class all the way. And he's handsome. <laughs> and he's so t- handsome. <laughs> You know, as we kind of pivot into Halloween six, I I first wanted to ask you growing up, were you a fan of horror movies at all? Or did you have any horror movies that made any sort of impact on you? No. (laughs) It's so funny. So many people, so many horror stars say that. But um, (laughs) is it because you didn't like them? They were too scary or any particular reason? Or they just weren't on your radar? They they kind of weren't on my radar. I weirdly enough, I do remember, you know, because Halloween one was such a huge success. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going to the movie theater. Remember movie theaters uh, with my <laughs> with my older sister, and we went with her friends in high school um, to see Halloween, and that was like the only time I really went out of my way to see a horror movie. And that's why it's so ironic that, you know, years and years later, I ended up being in Halloween six, never would I have guessed. Um, But we we were terrified, terrified. Like at the, you know, the end when Michael's gone and we were sitting in the car talking about it. And my sister had her, she was driving and she had her knees up on the steering wheel because we're all just like talking about the movie or the, the older kids where I was just sitting there and, um, <laughs> and, and her knee slipped and it hit the, the uh, windshield wiper thing. And the windshield wiper started going like this and we were screaming our heads off because we didn't know that like she had accidentally done that you we thought it was looked, michael michael myers was coming out. he's clearly under the car right now <laughs> and we're so effed um and oh so, you can cuss on this podcast please do <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah that's really that movie i really uh, and then later in life, like I got turned on to Rosemary's Baby, uh, which is a big uh, favorite of uh, Dan Ferenc, who you're interviewing. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, exactly. And yeah, but like I never, uh, it was never like a thing for me. And it's interesting when you do conventions, the people who come to conventions, they assume that the reason you did the movie is because you're a horror movie fan. And it's like, oh no, it was an audition. Yeah, that I no, had to go that on. And, yeah. and I got it and I was thrilled to do it because it's money, it's a paycheck. And in this particular instance, Dan Farron's script was so brilliant. Um, and the role he wrote for me was so amazing. I was just over the moon, but I didn't do it because I, it was like, oh, it's a horror movie. I have to only do horror movies. Yeah, I no. horror movies. It's like random. 
Well, well, speaking of that, because we wanted to know with Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, which for listeners, if you're unfamiliar with the Halloween series, first off, what are you watching? But no, secondly, um, the sixth installment in the series, um, this was your feature film debut, right? As a lead, yes. Oh, oh okay, yes. Um, what was the audition process like for the role of Kara Strode? What did you do in the audition? How did that go? Um, well, there were many auditions, like there was the, the first audition, then there was a callback, and then another callback, and then there was a chemistry read with Paul Rudd mm -hmm. to see if we had chemistry, because he was the number one choice, and I was the number one choice. He was the number one choice for Tommy Doyle. I was the number one choice for Kara Strode. We did the chemistry read, and then it was basically like, you got it, but um Definitely had to do the scene where I'm looking through the camera uh, across the street and looking into my bedroom where Beth is with my brother. Mm -hmm. And I say, Beth, there's someone in the room. He's right behind you. Ah! <laughs> um, I had to scream. They made me scream. Yeah. And um, Mus Mustafa Akkad, who, God rest his soul, who's no longer with us, you know, he was the producer of the movie um, and the Halloween franchise. Mm -hmm. And he was always there. And he was a big supporter of, of me playing Kara. Nice. And he was such an elegant, lovely uh, man with a real European flair. Like he wore silk ascots and cashmere sweaters and tweed blazers with these <laughs> fade patches you know the way i like my men to dress I'm gonna say tim that sounds I, like your fashion i totally would wear that <laughs> i tim. would I, absolutely wear that yeah i love it i i just love that look and um he he was very kind and uh warm in a very reserved way and uh yeah, that was that was it. I and apparently my auditions on the internet somewhere. And like a few years back, someone showed it to me. I was like, I can't believe I got the part wearing what I was wearing. Like I was wearing like a peasant dress with like <laughs> some random Agnes B black sweater over it. And it was just I was like, wow, I <laughs> I really got that. It, it was the style oh, of the time. Well, and it was, I feel like that's good for yeah. Kara because Kara isn't like, you know, she, it seems like she's not one who's like dressing risque or trying to be like, you know, that. Well, that's of, what I felt. Yeah. Yeah. And so she's a more, seemed like a more reserved character, you know, who's not flaunting things. Did you go back and watch the sequels after Halloween? Yeah. When you got the part. Yes. Okay. So what I did was when I got the part, there really wasn't a lot of time. It was like, I had to be in Salt Lake city in a week. So I went to blockbuster video. You're yes. too young, remember. Of course. And I, I, I rented number one and number two, which I had seen, but years ago, mm -hmm. everyone told me skip three. Yes. It's not going <laughs> to help you understand what's going on. It's, so I, a, it's I, kind I of its own thing. Yeah, it's kind of its I, own I thing. listened and I skipped three and then I, I rented four and five. So I watched those four several times each. Uh, and that was kind of my homework, just so I know like what's going on and where we are and who's who and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I can imagine that's help. It's like doing your research on it. So, totally. right, so right off the bat, I just, I, I have to applaud you on your performance because Kara, she's such a a smart, caring and, and tough character. You know, she, I feel like she's the most Laurie Strode-like character of all the sequels. You know, she seems, she's always aware of her surroundings. She um, she kind of always puts her son first, you know, and you've made her into such a likable character. So if, right off the bat, want to applaud your performance in this film. Okay, uh, that is the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me <laughs> vis-a-vis Halloween 6, that I am the most Laurie Strode-like character. Thank you so much, because actually I was kind of going for that and I yeah. think Dan Daniel was in the writing as well yeah well I mean that's well it's true I mean you really are there's a lot of great characters in the series but you are really the most Laurie Strode like you feel like um she's a Laurie Strode like character which she's always you know and 
I, so I guess I wanted to ask, did you enjoying this kind of playing this more of this maternal like character, you know, who's always putting your son first and did people also often compare you to Laurie Strode or Jamie Lee Curtis from the first two? Um, not a lot. Y like you're one of the few who has compared me to Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode in the first two, which like, as I said, could not be a greater compliment. Uh, yeah, no, I just, Daniel just wrote a character that was kind of very me. And so it wasn't like, I didn't have to overthink things. And I, it just, I just kind of played it like me in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, we're good friends with Daniel Ferenc, but um, were there a lot of script changes and different versions of the film or what? I mean, yeah, we've heard some, but like how different was that the first, like meaning we know there's been a big evolution. Yeah, you know? like from script to screen, was there, what did you see change? I mean, you don't have to go with like every detail, but. Um, well, from the uh, the script that I auditioned with to the theatrical release, it was there was like an enormous difference yeah and then and then it became a big deal where i guess it was 2006 the blu-ray version of the producer's cut came out yeah and people thought oh this this is what daniel farron's wrote this is like the original no yeah that wasn't yeah not not even i say to people not even the producer's cut was what Daniel Ferenc wrote. I guess it was a little bit close. It was definitely closer because you had the, you know, you had that whole set, the Druid set and the underground uh, cult of the townspeople and stuff like that. But even that, there was just so many changes. You know, when you shoot a movie, uh, things happen like weather. And <laughs> so, our first week there, it snowed in Salt Lake City, which even for Salt Lake City was an early snow. And so they, so many things had to change and schedules changed and they had started getting behind in the schedule and they started like kind of basically ripping pages out of the script. Like, we don't need this. We don't need that. Like a lot of my scenes, by the way. Oh, uh, uh, wait, yeah. That one has to go, really? I can't um, imagine and, poor, poor Dan Farron's like seeing pages like just ripped out of the script. Nah, we don't need that. That must oh, her, be horrible. It was, you know, yeah, horrific. I, yeah. And Daniel was like my touchstone on set. Like I would I always go to him like, okay, so what did you intend here? And what does this mean? What does that mean? He would explain everything because, you know, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of not just Halloween movie, the Halloween genre, but, or franchise, but uh, the horror genre. And, um, and then at some point he left the set and he went back to LA and I was just devastated because, and Paul was too, because it was like, well, who are we gonna ask? Like who, how are we gonna get guidance and advice from? Um, and then it just, the script that Daniel wrote had a beginning, a middle, and an end. It all made sense. It was brilliant. It teed it up perfectly for Halloween 7. Um, and then what ended up coming out in 95, the theatrical release, and then later the quote-unquote producer's cut, neither one of them were exactly what, not even close to what, Daniel wrote. I mean, some of it is still there. Definitely the beginning parts. Um, you have a heavy dramatic family scene at the, the, where you, you get slapped and you get like a bloody nose um, mm -hmm. from the scary Bradford English, aka mm -hmm. yeah, your father, um, John Strode. As a viewer, what was that like a fun scene to film or what? Where was your mind during this? <laughs> oh, like this is so pretentious, but I remember we wanted to make it like, like the whole thing was like, let's not play this family drama like a horror movie would play a family drama. Let's play it like ordinary people. Let's play it like for real 
This is a family with tension. There's domestic abuse going on here, clearly. Um, alcoholism. And uh, so we, I mean, I remember like taking it like very seriously. And now when I look back on it, I kind of do have to laugh because and moving the plot along, it really wasn't supposed to be. I love it. It's my favorite scene. Hey, hey, I got a couple. He's like the worst father, husband, everything. Like, it's so funny. And I'm sure that he's supposed to be. But like, literally, he is the worst person. Lies to the family about all of them living in the Myers house. You know, like, who does Lied that? Lied to us, John. I knew. You knew. You knew you the knew. whole time. I love when you say that. I know, I, I, oh my God, I'm getting goosebumps. I know. I only see ah! one bastard in this I, house. <laughs> I was, I, I, I mean, I think I, well, I'm just jumping ahead. I was, you know, there hasn't been six, in six years, there were no Halloween movies. So I, of course, saw it opening night. And I remember sitting there during that scene in particular. I'm not saying my family life is like that, but I'm <laughs> saying like, I thought it was the most real, like, there were real emotions there. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. it was like, it could all happen. And it was like, oh, that's different. Like yeah. I was- Thank you. Uh, yeah. No, it was great. It added, it was like, a, and that's another, why I love layer. the character, your character so yeah. well. It's such a multi-dimensional character, but that's what makes her tough. You know, she is the only person really who stands yeah. up to the father. Yeah. The mother is way too timid. Your brother is just kind of making jokes. Um, so you're the only character that actually stands up to him. So, you know, it is it is good, but- um, But shifting gears a little bit, I, I have to ask, the other lead in Halloween 6, made his feature debut film in Clueless, but um, we have to ask, what was it like to work with the hunk, Paul Rudd? <laughs> okay, Paul Rudd was so, so, so much fun. And it's interesting because Paul hadn't shot Clueless yet. We were in Salt, Salt Lake City shooting Halloween and he got a call saying he had a final call back for this movie, Clueless. Um, that he had auditioned for. So he had to get permission to miss a day of shooting and fly back, do the final callback and come back to our set. So we worked on it. We were always in each other's like uh, hotel rooms, like talking about like our favorite movies and our favorite actors. And we were like, so, you know, like the, the, intensity of like young actors like how passionate you are about stuff and we'd go to the blockbuster down the street and we would we'd be like what's the theme it's going to be all paul newman movies so we'd like rent hud and cool hand luke and blah blah so anyway we worked on his sides for his final callback and i gave him one note so freaking funny anyway. And you know, he's not playing a comedic character as Tommy uh, yeah. Doyle. And I would say to him all the time, I'm like, you're so freaking funny. You should do comedy. <laughs> and so then he has this final callback. We were working on it the night before he's leaving to go fly back to LA. And he had a line that where the German writer, philosopher uh, Nietzsche, is mentioned and everyone says Nietzsche, right? But he was playing this really pretentious kid who went to school back East Brown and stuff and really pretentious people say Nietzsche, uh -huh. not Nietzsche. Yeah. And I said, I promise you, I promise you, if you say Nietzsche, every other actor is gonna say Nietzsche. If you say Nietzsche, which is the, the correct German pronunciation, and you go to Brown, it's an Ivy League school, that's his character. Mm -hmm. Like you, you but trust me, you'll you'll be you'll be saying Nietzsche and you will get a laugh. And he came back and he was like, it got a laugh. Oh. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, and then he got it. I yeah. know. And I, I, um, that is I don't know if you know this, but then he got it. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, who, well, <laughs> wait, wait, I have to he ask. Is he is clueless, you I, guys. I have to ask, did he say, oh my God, I got this movie with the girl from the Aerosmith videos? <laughs> no, no, it's so funny, I know. Um, But like, uh, so it was interesting because Clueless came out summer of 95. 95. 
And then we had to come back to set to do reshoots in like August of 95. I'd moved back to New York. He was living in New York. We had to go back to LA, shoot these this week of reshoots. But in that small period of time, he was now like the person recognized in the airport. Like he said, 14 year old girls and gay men love me. Hello. <laughs> Kim and I are both 14 year old girls yeah. and gay men. <laughs> exactly. He was like in airports, they're just like room. And I was like, Polly, Polly, oh my God, you're famous. But it was interesting because everyone thinks like, oh, Clueless came out first and then Paul Rudd did Halloween 6. It's, he got Halloween 6 first. Yeah. Then Clueless, but then Clueless came out before Halloween 6. Do you, do you still keep in touch with Paul at all? Or when was the last time you spoke or chatted You know, with him? when we became friends, we must remember this is back before social media, uh, cell phones. You had to like have the person's phone number of their home where you would call and leave a message. Yeah. And then they would get the message and then they would call you back. <laughs> Um, and like now when I do stuff, you know, everyone trades information you friend each other on Facebook and, you know, you, you have everyone's cell phone, you put it in your phone. So we stayed in touch for a little bit and then we like felt completely out of touch because there was just no way ever, like yeah. everyone, you know, you move and yeah. when you move your phone number changes, like if you move to New York or wherever, but then we, uh, we're both involved with this charity for stuttering children in New York. And so I saw him a couple of years ago. It was like two years ago at, um, at an event for say stuttering association for the young. Mm -hmm. And we just started talking and it was like, no time had passed. Oh, that's awesome. That's it great. So yeah. Because it's like, it's you so have that fun. connection, you know, doing, especially both of your first, you know, lead roles, I guess, in movies, you know? Also, Paul's really cool because he doesn't have like a snobbery about like now that I'm a big star, I'm going to forget that I did that movie those all those years ago. You know, he he doesn't have that thing. That's awesome. He's very, that's why he's so likable. Yeah, I know. He really totally. seems like that. Um, he's, he's so likable. And um, so. I, I mean, my favorite scene is your audition scene um, with the camera and everything. What's your favorite scene? That scene. Oh, that's a, oh, it's a nice. good scene. It's so suspenseful. Well, but we also have to talk about, I, I have to mention your beautiful swan dive out the window toward the end. <laughs> now, I'm assuming you didn't do that yourself, but I do want to know, um, were you on set that day? And did you have any part in that dive? Like, did you kind of lean out the window and then you were on the ground like how much were you involved with that beautiful swan dive okay i have so much to say about the swan dive <laughs> i can't even <laughs> number one my mother my own freaking mother now obviously the swan dive was not me flying out the window it was a stunt double right uh -huh, yes yeah, so. but my lovely mother who doesn't know such things she said, oh, Marianne, and my favorite scene of yours was when you went out the window in the swan dive. And I said, <laughs> that's not even me. You can, tell, you can tell the stunt double that that was your favorite scene in the movie. Thank Thanks, you Mom. Much. Wasn't even me. Second of all, um, I remember uh, Dan and I did snicker just a little bit like oh yeah everyone goes when you jump out a window because there's a crazed old woman wielding a knife at you you always go out in a swan dive right like we <laughs> kind of made fun of it because it's like it's, it's just quite a jump it is quite a jump I would have done it would have been a little bit of a messier situation of right? course and um I had nothing to do. All I did was, I didn't go near the window. It was just like, I'm, I'm looking at the window and then I turn around and there's Mrs. Blankenship and she's like, hello dear, with the knife. And I was like, <gasps> and then I turn back and then they cut. And then, <laughs> and then 
then they do the stunt double lady who I they do think they did an amazing match because even I am like, oh, the hair looks the same and the outfit looks the same. It, you yeah. know, it is the same outfit, but the hair especially is hard to get right because this is my real hair. And like, usually if you just get a wig with curly red hair, yeah. it doesn't look the same, but they sprayed it with gold and yeah, they did a great job. No, that is right. I love that. You know, another person we have to ask you about, because we'd be remiss if we didn't um, mention the late, great Donald Pleasance. And, you know, that being his final film, him being such an important part of the Halloween legacy, and you and Paul Rudd got to have scenes with him. What was he like to work with, especially at that point? Okay, one of the reasons I was so excited about getting this part is because Donald Pleasance was in the movie. And you know, I'm, you know, he just, he's such a magnificent actor. I mean, he takes lines that are just, you would think are throwaway lines and he makes them Shakespeare. <laughs> and we weren't supposed to know that he was ill, but we kind of figured it out because he really, he was in his trailer most of the time with his wife as his caretaker. And he was walking with a cane. So they had to add that you know, into the movie that like, you know, he has some line about the cane because he, he Donald Pleasance, the human being was actually walking with a cane, but he, he was just magnificent and he had such an amazing sense of humor. Um, and I, you know, when I'm really, when I really worship someone and I think they're like totally amazing, I can't talk around them like I become mute and I am like this and they, <laughs> and they think that I'm like rude or like cold, like I'm not being chatty and stuff, but it's just because I'm so intimidated. And I was kind of like that with him. And one day we were sitting in our uh, director's chairs and this was rare. He was out sitting with us. I guess we were about to shoot. And I was reading, remember the magazine Vanity Fair? Of course. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I don't feel so ancient, but you know, it was like, you know, the thing to read. It was fab. And so um, I'm reading, you know, Vanity Fair. And he said, what are you reading? And I hold up the magazine and I show him the cover like Vanity Fair and he goes ah Thackeray's best because <laughs> Thackeray wrote Vanity Fair right oh. <laughs> and I was like I know it's like so super inside a joke that like it's really you do have to like it's the kind you get like on the elevator on the way down you're like oh that was um, uh, Thackeray's best and I was like what oh that's good um, and oh so f just so funny and and then the last scene of the movie which Dan liked to call Dan Farron's like to call like Danny, um, Tommy, and Marianne go off for a happy meal to McDonald's yeah. like after all this in our Jeep because all this stuff had helped mayhem had happened, but then they use a shot of us from like the first cut. Yeah. And, you know, there's nothing like we're not beat up or anything. And it was so freaking freezing. I've never been so cold in my life <laughs> to this day. I'm 54 years old. Never in my life have I ever been so cold as I was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Wow. We were so cold. And so, so uh, Donald Lenz is, is standing outside of the passenger window where I am. And uh, I say, you know, come with us. And he's like, no, I have some business to attend to. <laughs> and um, during one of the, and I, I think I said, where are you going? And then he says, to the Bahamas. <laughs> <laughs> And like, they're like, cut. <laughs> All right. 
that was funny. That was cute, Donald. But it's 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 like two thirty in the morning, and like, can we just wrap this up? <laughs> and I was like, "F you! This man is like a miracle," and that was hilarious, and that was so <laughs> worth it. Oh. Um. And then yeah, it was such. It was, it was shocking, but not shocking when I got the news that he had passed away at his chateau in the south of France, but because it was, he did seem weak. And um, I did think, wow, what a way to go out. You know, you have a chateau, you know, in Port du Vence in the south of France. Like that's where I want to go out. <laughs> Don't me we too. all? It is, it's so- Oh, he didn't pay me quite enough when paying double scale. I didn't quite <laughs> make enough, but. It 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 it, it feels as a Halloween, a huge Halloween fan, like to know that that was his last movie means something, you know, that 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 was like kind of his last hurrah. And it's just such it's so sad. But at the same time, it's like cathartic that it was by playing this character that people like myself, Tim, every horror fan grew up loving in this series. Yeah, and just the fact, yeah, and just the fact that you got to experience that final movie with him. That's so beautiful. You know what I mean? That I feel that to... way too. Thank you. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, I feel about it. Um, um, so oh, uh, I was going to ask, uh, was there a red carpet premiere or when the movie came out or any kind of special cast and crew screening? Um, okay, as far as the cast and crew screening goes, there was one in Los Angeles in the spring of 95, which we thought was this, this that was basically the producer's cut, okay? Oh. So we were like, okay, this is it. This, this is the movie. You know, even, you know, people who care, cared about the movie, Paul, myself, Daniel, were not thrilled, but it was like, all right, this is it. Um, and so much so that the costume people got rid of the costumes and, you know, we were moving on and that was the cast and crew screening. And then that movie was going to come out in the fall to coincide with Halloween. And then uh, Miramax did these, uh, test screenings with like 14 year old boys um, who hated the movie said there wasn't enough violence wasn't enough gore and the ending sucked and I believe that was a direct quote the ending sucked oh, God. so um, the Weinsteins in their you know wisdom um, <laughs> uh, decided that they were going to do reshoots and so that's when they called us back over that summer, I was in New York. Paul was becoming famous because of Clueless. And he had grown his hair long. I had cut mine. And it was like, oh, you have to go back to LA to do like eight days of reshoots. LA, we shot it in Salt Lake City. How's it gonna match? And, and they're like, oh, don't worry. It's not your problem. So we get there and I go for my costume fitting and I'm like, so where's like the white, like dress thing. And the new costume designers are like, well, um, the costume designers thought the movie was locked after the cast and crew screening. So they, they gave away, sold or gave to Goodwill, or I don't know, whatever costume people do with costumes, <laughs> um, and gave them away. And I'm like, oh, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? <laughs> like, it was my problem, you know? <laughs> and I said, so what, like, what happens now? And they're like, we're just gonna try to remake them exactly. We're watching the, the movie and and I gave them guidance too. I was like, it was more of a boat neck than a skin. Uh, I love wow. that. Wow. <laughs> You're like, um, can we get the neck correct, please? The neckline really needs to match. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so they had to redo the costumes completely. And it was, I think, you know, unless you're one of those complete, those people who notice like every little thing, continuity geeks. OCD. I, <laughs> yeah, OCD. Um, I think it kind of worked. 
because they put extensions in my hair and Paul didn't want to cut his hair, but they cut it enough to sort of make it match. But if you look really closely, you can, the scenes where the scenes shot in uh, Salt Lake City in 94, Paul's hair is much shorter. And then, and then the, when you see a scene where his hair is, has just a bit of a curl, just a tiny bit of bend, yeah. you're like, that, that was shot in August of 95. I, I do uh, have... I do have to ask because, you know, I think both the endings in both cuts have uh, pros and cons. You know, I, I'm not a big fan of that crazy added gore violence. You know, I'm not one of those people. It's like, I yeah, love more that. Gore. Just no, like- but in the, but I will say in the theatrical release for in the ending, your character does get like a big fight scene where you get to beat the shit out of Michael Myers. Which ending did you prefer? Like, did you enjoy getting that extra scene with the lead pipe? <laughs> yeah, I did. I, I see. I really I really loved, by the way, the lead pipe that's made of styrofoam and painted. Yes, of course, of course. (laughs) With the other Michael Myers, by the way, I'm sure listeners I read about said they had a different Michael Myers during the reshoots, right? That's so crazy. (laughs) You know, Uh, you tell me I didn't know. Miramax thought that George Wilbur uh, looked a little too pudgy in the silhouettes of him. I mean, insanity. So, so they the, thought we're going to make sure that in the next scene, Michael Myers is slimmer and people just think he like fasted for a few day, for a few hours. And, and grew like five inches because this guy was 6'3". Oh, wow. He was 6'3", and he was a stunt man himself, obviously. Um, and he he's, looks quite different from George Wilbur. George Wilbur, who I loved. I liked the other guy too. I forget. I can't recall his name right now, but. Um, I think it may be Michael Learn. Michael. That's well, it. Oh, he's, yeah, I saw his headshot. He's a good looking guy. <laughs> he is. He was, he was. Tim and, and the serial um, killer. I am in the serial killer. <laughs> no, he was, he was. He was going to take me to learn how to line dance. Oh. Um, Would and- you have made him wear the Michael Myers mask during that? No. <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> oh, man. Um, but uh, where, where were we? We were talking about. Oh, you're ending with the lead pipe. And if you liked that versus. You no, know what I ending. really did love that I got to get that aggression out on Michael Myers. But the theatrical release was, I mean, the ending really didn't make any sense and it wasn't written by anybody and it was just kind of thrown together at 2 30 in the morning and they were on the phone with new york begging for another day and um uh miramax said nope that's it you have to you have to end it tonight that's it and so it was like basically paul rudd myself Joe Chappelle, the director, this guy, Chris Garrity, who was the first AD standing around trying to figure out like, so what should we do? And then someone had this idea of like, like having, you know, that syringe with the green stuff, like just laying near the mask. And that's like the last scene. I mean, it was not my idea, but I just walked away because I was like, "I, I, I don't even know what to say. Um, but as Daniel will tell you, he wasn't madly in love with the ending of the f- producer's cut, which was the first movie, the first version we saw, which was the cast and crew screening that everyone thought was like, okay, this is the movie. And that, so much so that like people went throwing stuff out. Oh. Um, like it, it's, I recently, for the 25th anniversary, I did a watch along and it was of the producer's cut, which I hadn't seen since 1995 for that cast and crew screening. I never saw it, you know, I never saw it again. And um, the mood of it, I thought was really, really A plus and very interesting, but because it wasn't able to be what Daniel wrote in the end, it didn't, it didn't work the way I think Daniel will tell you when you interview him. It didn't work the way he thought it would work. Yeah. It was no. supposed to work because it was wasn't it wasn't it wasn't his writing. It wasn't his script. It wasn't, you know. No, exactly. Uh, 
Wow. No, there's a lot that is <laughs> that I know changed and I can't even imagine um, being the writer and seeing kind of what you've written, like transform so much, you know? Um, Absolutely. Well, I, I did. We did want to ask you as we move off of Halloween 6, you know, you've been in um, a number of other horror films like um, Stakeland, Dead Calling, Breadcrumbs. And I just wanted to know of, of the other horror films you've done, are there any that are your favorites or that you would recommend over others? Because we did see that um, in Dead Calling, you were with, you starred alongside a ton of Halloween alum, like PJ Souls, Charles Cyphers, um, Ellie Cornell. Like that was just crazy. How many Halloween Can I, can I tell you something? <laughs> Dead Calling is not a movie. It does oh. not exist. <sighs> Dead Calling is a trailer. Oh. That was made by a guy named Mike Nichols and uh, Dean Winters and myself have tried to get it taken off of IMDb for oh. years and they won't, they say it's, none of those people are in it. PJ Souls was in it, but we didn't work together. It was a trailer to try to get the movie made. It's like two minutes long. Oh my god! And it's not. It's not a movie. It doesn't exist. Oh my god! Uh, thank we you. Totally, we were wondering. We were, we were like, gonna, where can we find we it? We were looking all over to find this movie, and we were like, we can't find it anywhere. But there's so many cool people in it. That oh my no, god! Okay. It, was shot, it was shot out in um, Long Island, like near the Hamptons. It actually was where uh, Breadcrumbs was shot, and. Um, I just will never understand how they were able to get it put on IMDb as a feature film. Yeah. It was yeah. I well, feel mis duped. <laughs> mis mystery solved. Thanks yeah, for telling thank us you the for truth. Telling us. Um, wow. Yeah. I was wondering, like, it did seem too good to be true. Yeah, there were like, so wow. many Halloween alum and I'm wondering, wow. Okay. I was like, we tracked down everything. How did we miss yeah, this? Yeah. How did we miss this? And don't you think it would have been like such a huge movie for Halloween yeah. fans to be watching, right? Oh my if God. Of course. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then. Is um, there a favorite of your other horror movies that were actual movies? <laughs> yes. Um, I loved, I loved, loved, loved Last Kind Words with uh -huh. Brad Dorff. Yes, Chucky. the voice of Chucky. David. I, 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 of course, being of an older generation, think of him as, um, uh, what's his name? And One Flew Over the Cuckoo's yeah, Nest. He was nominated for an Academy Award for that. Of course, yes. And, um, he is brilliant. Also a Halloween alum because he was Sheriff Brackett in Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 and 2. Oh, was he really? You yeah. know what? I haven't seen any of the Halloweens after Halloween 6. Wow. Not even the 2018 one with Jamie Lee Curtis? Um, yeah. And, and I love what she's done, you know, the woman empowerment thing that she's mm -hmm. done with Laurie Strode versus Michael, you know, like Michael re represents basically all the men who have, you know, been bad boys. And, <laughs> you know, Laurie Strode is like the fighter for women and the Me Too movement. Have you seen all that kind oh, of- Oh, yes, yeah. She, yeah, she um she seems to have really embraced Laurie Strode and she has made it into yeah. a good tale, which I think is a good tale for, you know, for now. And it is, uh, I will say Halloween 2018 really did- um, but, you know, it's nice to see a survivor years after they've gone through trauma, which is exactly why I would love to see Kara Strode this long yeah. after. Um, would you reprise the role if they ever asked you today? Like, they were like, hey, we're getting Paul Rudd. You, we want you back. Yes. And like, like in uh, negative second, like I was <laughs> like, yes. I love that. <laughs> I love that note too, because it, it is really cool to be. It ain't, not, I would be like, I would die. I mean, to be such again. an such an integral character in this series and one that has survived, you know, so that it is really, really cool. There is a, there is a man um, who is a huge fan and he wants to bring my character back and he's written a script for it. And we've been talking about it and it's called um, Halloween, the final curse of Michael Myers oh. or the curse of Halloween it has two different titles, but it's been tricky because of COVID now with the Delta variant. Um, he lives in Florida 
And, you know, Florida is just a flame with COVID. And, mm-hmm. yeah. and um, I just don't know. Uh, it's, we'll see. We'll see. That if sounds I promising. have bigger news about that, I will, I will let you know. Yes, please. We love your character. We love this series. And the thing is, what's good about the Halloween series is they can continue doing the Laurie Strode movies, which are great, but there's alternate kind of timelines in a way. And there's no reason why they can't continue Kara's timeline also. Well, that's you know? what he wants to do, but it'd be a very, very small independent film i just don't know what the audience would be for it what do you guys think uh i can say that there is a huge well here's the thing like we as horror movie fans people that listen to this podcast people that love horror um they are dedicated to these series in a way that i I, i've never seen any sort of dedication yeah we follow it wherever it goes and i will (laughs) say this and as one and i'm i'm not bullshitting you i promise not just because i would love to have you do this movie we spoke with tom matthews who was in friday the 13th part six Uh and after that movie his character didn't continue well a few years ago a fan film was made continuing his character that's what this would be yes and it's it was an independent film just like that it's done really well and they're doing three more because it has had such a great reception so there's life for these characters after the first movie and, and i will say the fan film is beautifully shot it's it looks like a theatrical release. It's- and it, yes, it generates a lot of press um, because it's like, oh my God, they're bringing back this character, which means appearances and people like reinvigorating that love for the character. So, I mean, from my limited point of view, that's what I can promise. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for the career advice, you guys. <laughs> yeah. I have no one else to ask. No, no, I mean, but, I, but truly as fans, we absolutely loved your character, your performance and would Aww. love to see you continue to character and we do have one final question for you Um, we asked this to all of our interviewees it's a little bit putting you on the spot but I love those types of questions what is one thing that you can tell us about your experience working on Halloween the Curse of Michael Myers that you've never told any other interviewer convention publication or podcaster just one thing that you've never told anyone and it could be like a small detail like on Tuesdays, we had chicken. Like, it could be, like, so little. Or, or the biggest thing, like, Paul Rudd uh, g- got food poisoning and threw up on Donald Pleasance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I have something. Okay, so um, I told you how Paul Rudd and I would rent movies yeah. to watch at night or on our day off or something. And we had very similar tastes and humor and stuff. And there's a movie called With Nail and I. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Mm-hmm. It was George Harrison, the Beatle, George Harrison. Yeah. His movie company, he started a movie company called Handmade Films. And it was the first movie they did. It came out like in the early 80s. And Richard E. Grant is the star of it. And it is genius right so I said of course you've seen with Nell and I am holding it up he's like no and I was like okay you have to see this so one day where I was shooting and he wasn't he watched the movie and he came to pick me up we had I rented a car and he came to pick me up from set and I was like so did, did you watch with Nail and I and he's like I did I did I did not like with Nail and I (laughs) I loved (laughs) with Nail and I so a year later year and a half later I'm in LA and I'm reading remember details magazine oh yeah of course men and um, I'm reading it and it's an interview with Donald Logue, an actor who was like about to be something like he's really, really good. I remember him. Yeah, yeah. And um, Paul and they were doing an indie film together and they bonded because they both were obsessed with the movie with Nail and I and they could recite the movie from start to finish together. And so I'm like reading the article, looking for my name. 
right? <laughs> like, well, I was introduced to the movie by Marianne Hagen. We were shooting Hollywood. Da, 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 da. Never got credit. Oh. Never got credit. And I was like, the only the whole thing about their bromance is that they both are obsessed with with Nell and I. They can recite it from first line to last line, and it's all because of me. And I don't get any credit. What? <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah. Well, you know what? You were getting that due credit right here now. on Happy Hour Time, everyone. I want, I want it on the record. <laughs> all Rod only knows from with Nell and I. Because of Marianne Louise Hagen. All I right. Love that. <laughs> that is awesome. That is a great story. Yes. Well, look, we are so grateful, Marianne, that you took the time to chat with us. This has been so much fun, yes. seriously, for us. This we have enjoyed hey, this. So I much. honestly have to tell you, I was in a really low mood before we started this, and I am in the best mood right now. Oh, good. You Aww. guys, you're so smart, you're so funny you're so loving you're so delightful you just lifted me up and Aww. this is just like now my the rest of my sunday is just gonna be wonderful and i Aww. think so that is that. that is i can honestly say the sweetest thing anyone yeah. we've ever interviewed has said to us so it's thank you true. thank you we are such big fans, such big yes. admirers of you, and so grateful that you took the time you're to do awesome. this thank you so much you've been incredible yeah you're Thank awesome. you, Matt. Thank you, Tim. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Well, take care. Enjoy the rest of your day. Sunday, you. Sunday. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening to Happy Horror Time. We've been having so much fun talking to the stars from the Halloween series this month. As you know, Tim and I are huge fans and it's been such an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with Anna Alicia, Stacey Nelkin, Wendy Foxworth, and Marianne Hagen. They all are amazing and we just love them. And we hope you have been enjoying the interviews as much as we have. Please be sure to tune in next week as we celebrate our one-year anniversary since we relaunched Happy Horror Time and you can listen to our review of Halloween Kills. We saw the movie in theaters and rewatched it on Peacock, so we have a ton of thoughts and can't wait to share them with you. We also wanted to say thank you to Jacob, our producer and our editor, who has helped us so much along the way and has helped us make our All Halloween, All October such a great month for Happy Horror Time. It has been a dream come true, and it means a lot to us that you, the fans and the listeners, have been listening to us. We can't thank you enough. Finally, for our really dedicated listeners, or even our, you know, not-so-dedicated listeners, we also have a growing library of bonus episodes on our Patreon that we think you'll absolutely love. So if you'd like to support this podcast and get access to those bonus episodes and additional content, please visit patreon.com slash happyhorrortime and follow us on all of our social media channels at Happy Horror Time. Thanks again for listening, and have a happy horror time. <laughs>